Welcome. So wonderful to see everybody. Isn't it wonderful to all be here together? And great that we had that beautiful outdoor space where we could comfortably socialize and be safe at the same time. Um, I want to say thank you to Debbie McKeegan who secured this space for us and also to Robin and Carlotta and everybody else, all our volunteers that came to help set up and, and greet people and, and have fun and be together. And now I forgot what else I was gonna say. <laughs> so, um, good to be here. Can, I, can we take a minute to turn off our cell phones, please? I also wanna thank my husband, Steve, who had the brilliant idea to live stream and also to Art for creating a wonderful slideshow that those that were live streaming uh, got to see, but those of us that were forced outside uh, because of conditions couldn't see it, hopefully we'll get to see it again in, at another time. And also, thank you for Art, to Art for working with our videographer to merge our technologies, really appreciate it. Um, and we have Vince's team, Vince is our videographer, we also have her, and we also have Declan. Can we all take a minute and look over here at Declan. Everybody look at Declan. Now everybody wave. So we're, we're waving to all of our people that are joining us uh, from home so that we can all feel together. So it's wonderful. Um, I want to tell you that all, lots of things are going on at the Conservancy, always. Always growing and changing. And here to tell us a little bit about it is no, a man that needs no introduction, our CEO, Justin Owen. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, it's fun when, since we're recording this and live streaming this, I get two microphones. So I know it's hard enough to pry one out of my hands. So I'm having fun with two. Well, as Max said, um, we are doing our first live stream. And I'm really excited to say that this will also be recorded. So anyone who wasn't able to attend or watch will be able to watch this later on. So yay for technology and our first time trying this. Um, I do want to let you know that I'm excited to be here with you for those of our folks that are in person as well as those that are watching from home. It's been two years since we had a steward seminar and although it's been a challenging time since we've been together, we're very grateful for your support, encouragement, and confidence in our work preserving our Sonoran Desert and the McDowell Sonoran Preserve for all to appreciate. Also, I can't believe how fast time flies. It was just four short years ago, I was standing up here in front of all of the stewards, and I was only two weeks in. My welcome, two weeks in, was here's 120 people that are gonna stare at you and count on you to make something fun. <laughs> and I've gotta say, in that time, it has been my absolute greatest pleasure to be the CEO of the Conservancy for the last four years and I'm really excited for what the next four years and beyond are gonna bring us. I wanna start by saying that we are so fortunate to be the guardians of an ecosystem and a desert that always demonstrates resilience from which we have much to gain and to learn. We have been very resilient for the last two years and our desert and the conservancy has stood strong for over 30 years. In three days, we celebrate our 31st birthday wow, as an organization. Awesome. So it's a super exciting time for us. And through the, us being able to expand our focus to not only looking inside the preserve, but also outside, we are going to ensure that we are resilient for the next 30 years. Our expanded focus has been critically important given the situation we find ourselves in in a worldwide pandemic. Our treasured desert, beautiful open spaces provide us all with the mental and physical benefits at a time when we needed it so much. I can tell you the time to get away from all of the noise and worries of everyday life and enjoying all of these spaces, I think I can safely say fills all of our souls with the joy and energy we need to get through whatever we have going on. We are also reminded how fortunate we are, even though we're a small group, to have our amazing partners in the city of Scottsdale, as well as 
one of our great partners here today, Dr. Wesser from Scottsdale Community College, as well as Northern Arizona University, Arizona State University, and of course, all of you. And I will tell you, it truly takes a village to ensure that the Conservancy carries on. Over the years, our village has grown by hundreds at first, then by thousands, and now many more. Over time, our mission and vision have evolved to include advocacy, stewardship, research, and education, and how we continue to expand our impact continues to evolve. The past three years have been transformational for the organization, and we continue to reach and impact more and more people. Our Preserve Stewardship Program has helped thousands of people enjoy and appreciate our amazing treasure. Most people might not know, but during COVID, the annual visitorship of the Preserve went from 750,000 users to over 1.2 million users. It's because it was a place where people could get away and be outside and have fun. Our education programs have grown from three to 400 students to this year we hope over 5,000 students go through the program. Our science programs have evolved from their original purpose of helping the city of Scottsdale formulate where to put trails and trailheads and the best decisions to make in the preserve to conducting research to sustain our entire Sonoran Desert for generations to come and our work can now inform conservation work in arid environments around the world. As a specific example of the evolution we are a part of, just this past Tuesday, the Scottsdale City Council had a work study session that we were at, and it had a very critical conversation about what is next for the preserve and what we need to do to make sure that it is here for our children and our children's children. The Conservancy has been working with city staff and the Preserve Commission diligently through COVID to make sure that they have everything they need to make the best decisions for the Preserve moving forward. And I couldn't be prouder of the hundreds and hundreds of hours our team put in leading up to this meeting this past Tuesday. The Council answered a question that has been lingering for the last 10 years. What is the great what is the greatest and most important priority for the preserve moving forward? The answer from the council was very clear. Maintaining and caring for the preserve is the number one priority. This is a great achievement because those of you that have been here for short or long have heard a lot of the original priorities and how they were competing. Some priorities were land acquisition by all means. It, some of them were making sure that the trails were built out. And some were to finish the recommended study boundary. But to hear our city council say the focus of all of the energy for the preserve moving forward as a top priority is maintaining it and caring for it. If we're able to do other things, great. But to have them define long-term care as the top priority is something this organization has been fighting for since we were successful enough to first make this place happen. As I said a little bit ago, our village has grown, and sometimes we all know growth comes with growing pains. I can say the biggest growing pain for us has been COVID. As some of you can imagine, it's uh, been a word that I've heard the most through the pandemic is fluid. It's probably the last word I ever want to hear again. But I can tell you we have been fluid. Because under normal circumstances, we'd be doing three steward seminars a year. We'd have the opportunity for either myself or a member of our team to come talk to you and give you the view from 50,000 foot on the Conservancy three times a year to discuss our milestones, where we're going, but also our challenges. But since we haven't been able to get together for the last two years, we've had to be really fluid. Probably two of the greatest examples of the fluidity the Conservancy has had has been in our financial capacity and our staffing resources. To use an example, five years ago, we had just five full-time staff and four part-time staff. Unfortunately, at that time, we hit some hard financial times. And when I started with the organization in 2018, we had to be reduced down to four full-time staff and three part-time staff members. 
We were in a really tough financial position, and I can tell you, I was blown away by the number of stewards that had stepped up to fill the gaps and help us get through it all. I know one in this room that I saw that not only continued to give thousands of hours in the field, also sat in my chair before I came to the organization and served on our board. Paul, I am incredibly grateful for all of your service through those tough times for the organization. Over the next year after I started, we regrouped, mobilized a lot of steward task forces, and pulled up our bootstraps. We eliminated our six figures of debt, built out a plan to start building strategic operating reserves, and put the conservancy on track for a solid future. Through strong financial planning and building strong support and funding partnerships, we grew very quickly, and we're up to 12 full-time and four part-time staff within just two years. In that short period of time, we also doubled our budget and our financial capacity due to our amazing partners. Well, then something happened called COVID. And you all remember when that first hit, we had to make some really tough decisions. With the cancellation of events and in-person learning, we had to reduce the team back down to nine full-timers and two part-timers. Well, as many of you have seen, our team and our stewards don't give up in hard times. What do we do? We work even harder. As one of our founders, Jane Rao, likes to stay, say, still to this day, and this summer we will be celebrating her 100th birthday, so we hope we can have an in-person event because she's still with us and we're planning a big one for this summer. But she still to this day tells me the conservancy is and has been the burr under the saddle that doesn't let go and doesn't give up. And that's who we are. Thanks to the amazing support of our stewards, our funders, and our community, we have weathered COVID very well. We have done so well in our strategic planning that our, our staff will soon be up to 18 people. In addition, our budget and capacity has more than tripled in the last four years. We're also debt free. We have a substantial credit line in case of financial uncertainty in the future. As well, we have built up our reserves with a structure to get us to six months of full operating reserves in the future. Now I know from the conversations I've had with a few of you in the room and some of you watching, the question has come up, well, how did we grow so fast, and how come I didn't hear about it? And I hate to say it, but the simplest answer is because we haven't been able to do this in quite some time. We haven't been able to get together and talk about everything that's been going on. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have an opportunity to sit down and go on the journey together about how we got here and where we're going, but I know Max and Dr. Wesser and a few other people in here would probably kill me if I went down that rabbit hole today. <laughs> so, I wanted to let you know that I hope anybody who would like to will be able to join me on February 24th for our Steward Lunch and Learn. Myself and some other members of the team will be walking everyone through our previous challenges, our strategic growth, plans for the future, and what we can accomplish moving forward. As a small teaser, We'll talk through general staff support, grant-funded roles, and leveraging our partnerships to get the best ROI. For example, one of the strategic things we've done is we've built out the team, and more of a third of our team members are over 50% grant-funded. That's something we hadn't had before. So we're being very strategic in this. The other thing that I wanted to give you a quick heads up on is we're moving into a new office pretty soon. So, as we've grown and matured, we've also run out of room. I know when I started, we already had some space issues, and I'm extremely grateful for those of you that have been storing things at your homes, keeping experiments in your refrigerators, or might I add, microwaves. Shout out to Jane, who's watching. Thank you for letting us use your microwave for Site 33. And finding creative places to have orientations and meetings especially for those of you that have ventured all the way to our office 
and made the two to three block walk and hike to find parking. We have made a commitment to our staff and our stewards that we're a professional and sustainable organization that gives you the resources you need to serve our mission. Now, we're not moving very far. Actually, we're moving closer to here in the preserve. Our new offices are off of Frank Lloyd Wright and 90th Street. It's just east of the 101 on Frank Lloyd Wright. Our space is bigger. It will have steward workstations, conference and training rooms to accommodate program orientation, seminars and trainings, with two of them being able to combine into one giant room to accommodate CLT meetings, board meetings, and even Stewardship 101 if needed. Also, we have parking. <laughs> we are going from eight regular spaces and two visitor spaces to over 40 parking spaces with the ability to borrow more from the building if we have large meetings and events. We'll talk more about the new office at the Lunch and Learn as well. And we're going to be hosting a couple of open houses for all of you to come to the new office, meet the staff, and learn more about what we're planning on doing. Also, while I know you will be really impressed by the new space, I want to assure you that we looked at this move the same way that we did at all of our other resource planning. We asked ourselves, what is the best financial position we can gain while still accomplishing all of our needs? So I can tell you it is a much larger space. It is able to accommodate a lot more. But we secured a lease rate of over 26% less than the market rate for North Scottsdale. Also, our occupancy costs are now will be a smaller percentage of our annual budget than when we moved into the office we're in now. By having this new space, we're going to have a really cohesive environment for both the staff and stewards to work together. So I want to let you know, when you come to our new office, it re might remind you <coughs> excuse me, of, the pro of a professional office setting that you worked in during your career, or the offices that you visited when you've gone to Special Olympics, or Make-A-Wish, or the Botanical Gardens. I think that we can all agree that from our early beginnings through today, our staff and stewards partnering to expand our impact has always been the true recipe for success. The Conservancy couldn't serve our community without our army of stewards, and I'm proud to say that soon our staff and stewards will have a workspace that provides the resources to them. The stewards will have a professional team to help provide the expertise to continue to arm our stewards with the tools we need to be the guardians of our McDowell Sonoran Preserve, our Greater Sonoran Desert, and make sure our programs have the farthest reaching impacts and outcomes. Some of you may know that one of my favorite values of the Conservancy is our stewards learn so that they can ultimately teach. And by investing in our staffing resources and our workspace, we are positioning ourselves to provide all of the resources to teach our community how to care for their preserve, how to care for their environment, how to care for their ecosystem, and more importantly, how to care for their world. Our future, from the preservation of our treasured preserve to our mission of advancing natural open space through science, education, and stewardship, relies on the next generation of people like you and everyone that we touch. Educating and inspiring the next generations of stewards is truly at the core of where we started, reflects who we are today, and our future depends on it. Without you, the amazing stewards that make up the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy, our journey would not be possible. I'll close with a quote that many of you know that I love because it reminds me every day of why we do this amazing work. It's an ancient Native American proverb, and it, say, it says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. That is truly the sentiment that I believe in what we do every single day. So thank you all again for joining us today. I look forward to seeing many of you at the Lunch and Learn or at our new office. And I really do hope you have as much fun learning from 
Dr. Wesser, as I do every single time he speaks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Justin. I know we'll all be eager to hear more about it when you do our Lunch and Learn on uh, February 24th. Just to let you all know, our lineup for our spring schedule for Lunch and Learn is now on Better Impact. So have a glance at it. I know there's lots of topics that will excite you. And, uh, and sign up. And uh, we'll see you virtually at that time. So I'm always being thanked for being a volunteer. But I have to say, honestly, it's me that's so grateful for all of the opportunities that the Conservancy has afforded me. What a privilege it is to have continuing education, to feel productive, to give back to the community, all while you're having the most fun you could possibly have. Nine different programs partnering with the city, the Conservancy Board, all that coordination doesn't just happen. For that, we want to thank our core leadership team, and I'd like to welcome our Chair, Rick Pierce. Is this on? That's clear. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, it's not on. It is now. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me all right now that the microphone's where it's supposed to be. Huh? It's great to see you in person. Uh, it's been nearly two years, as Justin said, since we've been able to hold an event of this kind. Um, and the addition of the live, live streaming, thanks to the Stewart Events team, uh, gives many more of you a chance to attend this event uh, from home or wherever you are. And again, partially echoing what Justin said, after 18 months of shutdown or curtailed operations due to COVID, we've now re returned to all of our public facing activities. All of us I know are thrilled to be able to be back doing what we love. Now, during that time, Zoom and its relatives uh, enabled us to maintain working relationships and help keep friendships uh, strong, but could never quite duplicate what we get from being together in person. Apologies to those of you who are live streaming, but hopefully before too long, we'll all be back together in person. During the shutdown, some programs, notably Citizen Science, CNM, Patrol, and Steward Experience, were able to maintain uh, most or all of what they do because they didn't need to be together in person to do it, and it wasn't all outdoors, some of it was. Other programs, notably Guided Hike and Bike, Nature Guides, and Past Finders, um, were forced to shut down completely. And then Pathfinders were able to run limited trials last spring to experiment with ways to protect both the uh, Pathfinders and the visitors. But other than that, they were also idled. During the past two years, the core leadership team also underwent quite a few changes. A number of program chairs and assistant chairs had their terms end and they were uh, no longer serving in those capacities. Some actually moved out of state, so we lost several others. But the good news is that because of a strong pipeline, we were able to fill all of those positions quite rapidly and back them up with assistant chairs in every case. As Justin mentioned, the Conservancy completed and enacted a new strategic plan that took effect last July 1st. And a number of program chairs and uh, CLT members, as well as other stewards, helped the Conservancy management and the board uh, create that plan. And now that it's been in effect for almost six months or over six months, um, a number of CLT members are also helping to construct programs, not programs, but efforts that will enable us to achieve 
many of those uh, initiatives. So we're back. And that's really the essence of what I wanted to say. None of us knows how the future of COVID will play out, but we have evolved our organization to remain strong in meeting our commitments to the city, the conservancy, the preserve, and to each other as stewards. And I'm confident that we'll be able to continue on that path. And I want to thank all of you in person and who are listening uh, for contributing to the resilience that allowed us to do that. Now moving on, you'll be hearing from our keynote speakers in a few minutes. I'm pleased to share some personal observations about Dr. John Wesser. Not only a longtime friend of the Conservancy, but he's become a friend to me and to many other stewards who have had the pleasure to work with him. I have been able to join John on citizen science uh, bird surveys in the preserve for a number of years now. And what I've learned is that his knowledge is not only about the birds, but also all of the flora and fauna that are out there. And that makes every survey an educational treat. We manage to greet a rattlesnake now and then, occasionally learn about caterpillars, butterflies, coyote gourds, and more. <laughs> Dodging a flushing western screech owl has happened on more than one occasion. Through all of this, John's storytelling, enthusiasm, and sense of humor, plus his natural ability as a teacher, stand out. In short, I'm sure you're going to enjoy hearing from him, and I look forward to it as much as I think you do. Thank you. Back to Max. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for your words, and thanks for all that you do for the Conservancy. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to let our live streamer know, streamers know that they also have the opportunity uh, to ask questions. There's a chat feature in the YouTube, so feel free to um, put your questions forward as Dr. Wesser speaks. So John Wesser got his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from ASU School of Life Sciences. He has been a teaching at Scottsdale Community College since 1996, and he has 32 years of experience teaching biology at the college and university level. John is an awesome friend and partner of the Conservancy. He's on our scientific uh, research team. He, had, he leads the butterfly and bird project. He's involved in many educational and research projects. And we so appreciate how generously he shares his time and expertise with us. So here to dispel our myth conceptions, um, please help me welcome Professor John Wesser. Uh, being invited and working with the Conservancy and working with you. So I go back to about 90, 1998, 1999 when I started the first work. Um, with the Land Trust and Conservancy um, through my time at Scottsdale Community College. Will it, will it have any of the dissolves? Good. Well, you can't see the top, but what that says is that the desert, right? Sometimes the stories of the desert unfold right in front of us. So I, you know, Rick will know. I'll be walking around and I might just stop and there's sand, and a lot of people are looking at me. I'll be on a bird count with, many, many of you might know Walter Thurber. Uh, he and I go out and bird often, and so sometimes I'll stop, he'll kind of look at me, but he's used to it now because I'll find things. And this is a neat trail of a lizard. That's the tail, you can see the four legs. Um, and then sometimes they're told, oh, next slide. Um, they're told to us, sometimes even by a postcard, and that didn't dissolve, but these are the, I remember when I was younger, before I moved out here from Chicago, there were postcards out there called jackalopes, and I'm like, what's a jackalope? I go, that can't be real. Um, and then I found one over there, it's a black-tailed jackrabbit, he might have been eating something. And then, um, as we go from there, we can go to the next slide, 
And so sometimes nature tries to communicate with us. So these are ways that nature uh, says don't touch. And so you can look at there, um, right? I could put cactus up there, like Joya. How many times have you told people don't touch Joya? It's like, don't touch Joya. And then you look back and they might be trying to touch Joya. <laughs> okay, it's like, <laughs> I told that somebody and next thing I know they had a Joya between both hands. <laughs> And I was like, oh, this is going to be fun to watch this get out. But I gave him a comb. Um, and so, you know, we can get into, if we flip the page, the next one. And uh, some of these we hope. Um, a baby versus an adult. Um, this is your side of the family, you realize. It's the one in the middle. Uh, he's not shaking his rattle, but his head. Um, and so this <laughs> often comes up in terms of um, who's more venomous. Hopefully we can see these graphs. If you can flip that um, next one for me. Um, so if you pull that up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Okay, so this is patient mass. And then the color bars are size of snake. And this is uh, snake bite severity. So they had measured this by treatment. Okay, and so if you look, you have um, patient there, and then the sizes, just to give you an idea, I brought a meter stick. Usually use this to point with. Um, and so if you're looking at the size of the snake, 75 is from this finger to this finger. Okay, that's the size of the snake there. Okay, and then the smallest snake they're looking at is 40 which is about from here to here, okay, is size. So what that really says is, when you look at snakes typically, snakes unlike us, where we stop growing, snakes have indeterminate growth, so they can keep growing if you keep feeding them through their whole life. So what we use that for is kind of an indirect quick measurement. Small snakes, probably younger snakes, okay, and then um, larger ones are older snakes. And so here you can see everywhere along that, and these are significantly different, um, you can see that the larger the snake, more severity of the snake bite. Okay, larger the person, less severity of the snake bite. But, um, and then we can flip the next page, or next slide. Um, and so on this one, um, what do you see here? So I don't know if they can see the title on that one. Um, Sorry, you have to work your way up and down on that. Um, and so if we look at it, one of the things, uh, I'll, I'll tell it because I can look at it there for you. So look at this. This is uh, snake total length in centimeters, so that really large snakes. We go here, and then that's venom volume, the amount of volume that is produced. Uh, so they can milk the snakes, and they can calculate the venom on average of those size snakes. And so when you look at it, I look at it and say, well, is this volume related to the aggressiveness of the snake? Larger snakes are more aggressive. What do you think than smaller snakes? No, okay, just size. And the reason I put aggressive in, in red is because I hear that a lot. You have to watch out for those larger snakes. They're more aggressive. Um, Etc. And I don't like using that term aggressive. That's a human, that's our term. Um, snakes bite either to get prey or defensive. So that could be a term you can lose, if you haven't, out of vocabulary when you're communicating with the, with the public. Because you don't want them to always think, oh, these are, they're going to come after me. <laughs> okay, you're 25 feet away from a snake. Oh no, it can still get me. Okay. Um, and so, they're not because they're aggressive. Here it's all about dose, right? A larger snake has a greater um, volume of venom, and so it's dose. So if we um, switch the slide, um, question comes, you know, here, are babies more potent, at least in Western diamondbacks? The, the baby's venom is a little bit different mixture. So any venom, bee stings, wasp stings, snake stings, is a cocktail of proteins. 
and it's those proteins that have impacts on various parts of your system. So some can affect blood and, and tissue that cause them to rupture. Others can affect the nervous system. And some have mixes of both, like Mojave's rattlesnakes have a mix of kind of hemolytic and neurotoxic components. And so here they milk it and, you know, the babies are different, but they're smaller amount, so they aren't going to inject as much, okay? And there's some issues. Do they gauge it? Do they, they typically bite. Yes, not every bite that you see is a, a envenomation. Some of it is dry, okay? Um, it's different, but it's a smaller dose, just like we saw. And so I, I like this quote. I found it somewhere where it said, um, it's kind of like equated to what has a bigger impact, drinking a shot of vodka or a case of wine in one sitting, okay? So it's two different, right, cocktails, <laughs> um, but volume is different, and they have a different effect. And so um, that's something to, to think about. If we can switch. So... That one uh, stole my thunder, but that's okay. Um, I was looking at these, and I know it's not a, I, I didn't have um, the um, calculations of local snakes. That's why there's a black mamba in there. So I was looking at some various information. And so this, again, is just getting dose. Honeybees are equal or more toxic than many rattlesnakes that we have. Okay, but again, who can deliver more? Okay, that's why you need hundreds of bees to impact you. Now, if you're allergic to bees, right, it doesn't take much because that's a different story. It's that anaphylaxis that, that comes through, that, that allergic reaction. But if you're looking at toxicity where they measure the lethal dose, the amount of that lethal dose per, you know, kilogram of, of animals, they look at how much does it take to, you know, I guess what's a polite way to kill the animal. <laughs> um, so that's how they measure it. And so uh, harvester ants. Um, I worked on harvester ants and leafcutter ants in my uh, dissertation. So I looked at interactions. I looked at learning and memory and all that kind of stuff and how they forage, foraging behavior, because I'm, I'm a behavioral ecologist. And um, <laughs> harvester ants, OK, have you seen those big circles when you're out on the trails? Um, sometimes like Brown's Ranch, because I go back to Brown's Ranch. So I have, my heart is with Brown's Ranch instead of San Francisco. And so, because we go back when you could drive actually up in the Brown's Ranch. And I know some of you who, they always, you always ask me, it's an historic society. Um, yeah, some of those cages are from us way back when and not prehistory. Um, and so, if you go there, you see lots of those circles. Those are um, a Pogana Myrmex or a desert seed harvester ant or a red harvester ant. They can give you a good wallop, okay? It just hurts for a day or two or three, okay? <laughs> um, and I was lucky. I worked on them for many years, and I was only stung once, and it was like my last year of my dissertation. So, um, but there is one that's called Maricopa um, that's extremely potent. It doesn't knock anybody down because it's so small. Right? In order to feel that effect, you've got to be stung by hundreds and hundreds of them. I have a, a colleague of mine, and it was on my committee, he would dig into a uh, pogo nest in the sandals. <laughs> and so I called him Badger Bob. Um, and so he just, don't ask me, he still does it. Okay? Um, and so if we go past that, that's just something to think about just to equate with the dosage. Uh huh. Um, and then coming up here is looking at scorpions. So uh, scorpions here, I often hear the small scorpions are the most dangerous to humans. You got to be careful of small scorpions, okay? Uh, well, every scorpion starts out small. <laughs> okay, these are arthropods, the animals with jointed limbs. They're related, right, arthropods. In the marine world, I also teach marine biology, so I kind of flip back and forth. Um, you have crabs and, and shrimp, okay, the crustaceans. And then, of course, we have our arachnids and our insects. Um, and so they all start out 
as little babies and then they molt and they get bigger. So how do you know if you have a little one that's not so bad, <laughs> okay, right? And so you have the, it's not as simple as that. Um, and so on the upper left, is that something you should be worried about? Okay, that one is the same as the one on the lower right, but younger, and that's our, our giant hairy scorpion. And that's the largest scorpion we have in North America. It has hairs on it, and you can see it's got kind of a more bulbousy, but it, it looks kind of thin and slender, and you know, but these eat other scorpions when they're larger. And so um, there, I've been told, I've met the person who has this pain index that you see on YouTube, uh, the Schmidt Index. I met him at an uh, entomology conference. So he, if you don't know him, he decided to get stung by various insects so he could have a reference point, <laughs> and he ranked them, okay? So he'd been stung by tarantula hawks purposely, um, bullet ants, you know, all sorts of different things. So, um, and um, I don't think he did because he was doing insects, these are arachnids, but I've been told that the giant hairy scorpion's like a bee sting or a, a wasp sting, not too bad, if you can tolerate it. And remember also that a venom is, right, a collection of proteins, so different species have different mixtures. So because you're allergic to a bee sting doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be allergic to a scorpion sting. So, um, so that one is uh, the ones that you typically see. Um, that one up there, we have, um, that's a, a striped tail scorpion, which is common out in the desert. These two here are, are bark scorpions. And those are the ones, those of all the scorpions we have, those are the, tend to be the ones you get in your home. Now, as you live along the desert, you'll see giant hairy scorpions, and you'll see all of them, OK? Um, but typically in your home, and anything that's climbing, is likely a bark scorpion. Okay? They're the climbers. Um, and they flatten out. Um, I usually look kind of, you can try to look at those pincer looking things. Those are called the pedipalps. They're a little slender. Um, you know, the striped tail has more of a Popeye kind of bulge at the tip there, a little chunkier. Um, these um, tend to often hold their, their tail to the side, but not always. They're, they like to slide into the, the thinnest of crevices, okay? And so you always have to be careful on those. That was the one I was stung by in the neck while I was driving down the street. Um, long story, you can ask me later. Um, they do give birth to live young, so they're uh, viviparous, we call them. So they produce eggs, the eggs hatch inside, and mom gives birth to live young and they ride around for a short time on her back, and they're really soft, um, and that's why they are hanging out with mom, because they're really soft, they can be eaten by other scorpions. Now after a couple of days, they might just jump off, and mom may not know that those snacks she's eating were her babies, because they don't have parental care. Um, and so, um, and a lot of people will tend to ask, and I've been asked, you know, are they, do they lay eggs? They don't lay eggs. They produce eggs, but they give birth, scorpions give birth to, to live young, okay? Um, and so, bark scorpion, um, next slide. I keep touching it, I'm just out of it. I can see my, um, Gila monster tails, okay? These come up here and there. Um, some of them, some think the tongue, <laughs> Um, these are true, they don't inhale, the breath can kill you, um, and then Gila monsters don't have an anus, and that's what they said, the, they forms the venom, that's where the venom comes from, okay? Yeah, I don't know how that works, um, but they're venom, they are a venomous uh, lizard. They often get confused with some of the misconception with Chuck Wallace sometimes, just because of the color pattern, but habitat-wise, they're very different. I know a lot of you, um, you see them, um, what, on the Tom Snum Trail um, or Tom Snum Canyon um, and all over, I guess, the, you see them. Um, typically, they're active, most active, usually kind of in March, April is when you start to see people, if they've seen them, and then again later on in the, in the summer after the monsoons. 
Um, but they are venomous. They, they don't inject the venom. Their teeth have a groove in it, and they kind of clamp hold, and they kind of grind and work their, their venom into your um, tissue. So it's a very, what we call ancient or, or primitive kind of delivery system. So it's not like a, a rattlesnake. You can get sick, spend some days in, or a day in the hospital. I've known a couple people who were accidentally built, bit when they were showing them. Um, and so not too, uh, not too dangerous. I don't think there's been a death from a Gila monster reported. Maybe they just couldn't report it. I don't know. Um, so we'll move on there. And then if you can do the next one for me. So this one, I think I found this picture on the, on the left. That was from Brown's Ranch. Rick, that might have been, were you out there? Um, I don't know. Um, so they were having a good time and didn't see the tarantula behind them. Okay, and so tarantulas often get a bad rap because they're like, oh, these will kill you. None of the ones around here will kill you. Okay, I think very few will. Um, in general in the world, but these don't deliver. They're painful because they're chelicery, those are those fangs. Those will pierce through you and they're pretty stout. So, you know, it's, it's a lot stronger than having a couple spines going through you, but uh, the venom is not, you know, life-threatening at all. Um, and so, um, they often, I often get this, that they're gonna leap at you. Have you seen them out there where they actually kind of rise up a little bit? So if you startle them and you'll see them like, I've seen them in summer and I see them in October. Usually um, in the fall, the males are looking for a female and they're wandering around. Um, females live a lot longer than males. Um, and so they're wandering around and they'll stand up and try to look larger, right? A lot of prey species tend to, and even snakes will do that, right? Puff up. Chuck, well, you know, you just puff up, you try to look bigger than you are and try to startle it enough. But they have their defense, right? They can, uh, urticating hairs, they can actually use their hind legs and kick hairs up and that can get into the nasal passages and into eyes of a predator and cause severe irritation enough to uh, stop an attack. Um, I've seen a coyote approach one of these and actually just put his head down and go wandering off shaking his head. Um, I've seen a young coyote, I actually have a videotape of it way back when, um, trying to figure out how to pick up a kangaroo rat. And it was, had it in his mouth, it squirmed and it flew out, and he picked it up again and it flew out. And then in that same kind of evening, I saw one try to encounter a, a tarantula and it didn't end well for the coyote. Those hairs do get into the lining and cause some irritation, but not, death, they're not venomous. Yep, change it for me, please. Um, so this is oftentimes, how many have seen the lizard? Um, <laughs> I get this all the time. I get this where it's doing a push-up toward me. It feels threatened. I don't, you know, um, probably doesn't care about you. Um, it might move away, but it's doing a display. Why would it be displaying at you? Now, what do you notice? Can these see color? What do you think? Can they see color? Yeah, how would you, how would you know just by looking at the slide that they can see color? Yeah, because of that, this is a male, and even up on the side a little bit, and its throat, okay, has that coloration to it. So these can see color. So could it be that maybe you're wearing a color and maybe they're responding looking at? Okay, I haven't seen the study if they, people wearing different colors if they get different results. Typically, you're not seeing something around you and it's displaying. Those displays, those push-ups, and if you watch them, and this is one of the beauty, right, when you're out there to try to communicate is, and I love it, I just go wandering out and walking out and Rick has to keep me in line. Okay, like, come on, John, gotta keep going. Because why, why do you go out there? You go out there just to stop and look and just take it in, right? It's a great way. I mean, when you, you've got a great 
job, if you want to call it a job, volunteer, okay, just to go out there and relax and try to teach people, just, just go out there and watch, right? So if you watch, have you noticed that these, these, this is a tree lizard. Tree lizards will do head bobs too. So those head bobs communicate information as well. They'll also do push-ups. So in a single mesquite tree, um, like you might see, oh, along the Salt River, or you'll see mesquite trees here. We don't necessarily have a bosque or bosque, which is like a, a little riparian forest along the edges um, of riverways or, or waterways. Um, you'll see five, six, seven different species of lizards. You'll find three or four in the same tree. And they partition the tree. So tree lizards are typically on the trunk, low down, spiny lizards are up in the middle. You have long-tailed brush lizards out on the edges, and they partition that resource. Um, and so they all do slightly different things. And, but they're usually those visuals and those head bobs are communicating male to male or male to female. So they'll do push-ups. And each one of those, one species does front push-ups just on their front two legs. The others do all fours. So I don't know who's more macho or trying to you know, get a better workout. Um, and so you can look for those and look for the head bobs. And those are timing as well. They're typically looking at another lizard is what they're doing when they're, when they're not, um, when they think they're threatening you. Oh, next slide, please. Um, so this is one that I've heard multiple times, and that is coyotes howl um, because, uh, did you hear it howl? Because it just killed something. Okay, why wouldn't that be, think about that, why wouldn't that be correct? Why wouldn't, it, why wouldn't you expect nature to produce, yeah? Yeah, and where they are, right? Because resources are limited, okay? Yes, even in urban areas to find, you know, a kill, you're not going to advertise it to your competitors. Hey, I'm over here, look at this great <laughs> supper over here, okay? Come on. And you're not going to communicate that to them. They are very communicative, right? They can talk, they, they howl and yip and yap within their, their group, but they're not going to say, hey, come on over here, look at where this kill is, okay? Because food's limited, and, and they're going to be selected to say, hey, we, we're working as a pack anyway, and we're working together. We don't want the other members of another territory or another group to alert them to this kill. So um, they, they don't... Um, do that. Um, this one over here, um, they don't, I've also heard that they howl when it's going to be a full moon. Okay, that's a lunar eclipse, but um, that just happened. This one, uh, by the way, if you were, some of you are looking, it says, okay, this time Rex and Zeke will be the wolves, Fifi and Muffin will be the coyotes, and listen, here comes the deer. Okay, so that's what they were looking at. And then on this one, um, how many of you seen this? I was just talking to uh, a member of the Forest Service, and last year they had uh, two individuals. Um, they had a young lady and her, her boyfriend out in the superstitions out by First Water Trail, it's called. And um, they didn't have enough water, and he uh, started to have, show signs of you know, overheating. So she left him with the water, all the water and a phone and went out on her own. And they found her with cactus spines. She tried to cut into a cactus to get water. And she was unconscious for many days because she started to eat the pulp of the cactus. And cacti don't want you if, you, if they can think, and they don't. But Right? They have spines for a purpose. Stay away from my resources there. And, you know, I often look at people and say, there's water in there. Well, yes, there is. There's tissue water, but there's also alkaloids and other types of chemicals that can cause severe dehydration through, um, you know, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, and those things aren't good. Okay? And she survived, he died. 
Um, and so, but she was pretty, you know, spent some time in the hospital. And then the following week, the Forest Service person told me they had another individual who tried to cut it in the cactus, same thing. They didn't bring enough water. It's not there, okay? It's, I mean, I look at saguaros, right? Um, you don't see a, a Gila woodpecker pecking on there and there's water pouring out of the saguaro when they're doing it. I mean, that's a good giveaway. Otherwise, you, you stand under there with your cup, your, your water bottle, right, and, and fill it up. So um, that's pretty common. I think you might come across those. I had somebody, I was on a Christmas bird count up in Carefree on the 30th, and I was coming out at sunset at the end of my count, and I saw people looking, and it was a beautiful sunset, and the saguaro, and they said, what was your favorite thing you saw? And I said, oh, this beautiful sun casting on the saguaros. And, you know, you encounter this. They said, what's a saguaro? And I pointed it out to them. And so you always constantly think, yeah, you've been here. It seems pretty straightforward that these things aren't in there. But you have to constantly, right? Everybody that you might encounter, you, you talk to, and you get the sense of, where they are and what their knowledge is and experience with the Sonoran Desert. So um, this one seems pretty straightforward, but um, that's what happens. And then this yeah. is a common one. Uh, this is, anybody know that plant? Mistletoe. Yeah, desert legume mistletoe. And this is, a lot of times you're like, oh, look at that. Mistletoe killed that mesquite. So... I've looked, at, I've looked at a couple dissertations people have written on mistletoe um, recently and looking at it. There doesn't seem to be any evidence that it's killing it per se, other than you tend to get a lot more of these in older mesquites. And then mesquites, plants get, what? They can get old and their defensive chemicals can wane and they can become stressed. And you tend to see individuals when there's a stress event, long-term drought um, or long-term um, maybe disease or age, and they tend to slowly go downhill, they can support a number of mistletoes in them and healthy ones do just fine. So is it causing it to die or is it just kind of there as it's going downhill, okay? Um, so it doesn't look like they're, I, I don't want, I don't say that it's, they kill them, okay? They're a hemiparasite, meaning that they're, they're green and they still photosynthesize. So they're, they're obtaining their own food. But if you don't know the story, these berries are eaten oftentimes by a bird called the Faina pepla. That's coming back, it's here in the winter and, and early spring and, you know, it's a, a black looking bird, a flycatcher with a crest and a red eye. Um, very beautiful. The, ma the males are jet black and the females are gray. And they nest in the mistletoe. All right? You have them in yards. I have pairs that come back every year and I live in, in Mesa and they, they nest not in mistletoe, so. <laughs> but they can use other things. But um, they tend to, but the, when they eat these berries, because this is a winter blooming, fall, winter blooming and fruiting plant. And so these berries are, are rich, they'll ingest it, but the berry, the fruit, okay, passes through its digestive tract. So that outer is kind of, um, you know, kind of a gooey um, material on that fruit. Um, and it passes through their digestive tract, so they extract nutrients from that, but the seed is not damaged typically. And so they deposit it, that's a nice way to droppings, um, and those seeds tend to prefer if they're going to spread and actually germinate, they'll germinate and be successful on younger bark, not the big thick bark of a mesquite tree. And they'll actually push in to, when you look at it, they'll push through the outer layer of bark, okay, that thin skin, and they'll get into what they call the xylem, um, which, you know, they'll get in and, and absorb phloem and xylem, meaning they'll get some of the nutrients and water from the tree, but they can photosynthesize and make additional nutrients that they require. So they're not 100% dependent, meaning just tapping all the resources out of the tree. 
And so that's why they call them a hemiparasite as opposed to a full parasite. Um, and so they can grow. These can be found in, in ironwoods. Um, you will also find them in creosote at times. But they seem to like the legumes. You'll see, you'll see them in, in polyverdes, et cetera. And so, yep, oh, next slide. See, I keep coming through there. Um, so I know I've, I've talked before on, on bees. So another one here is a, all bees make honey. And, you know, if you were going to say bees, and I was just quizzing hundreds of people who just came by when I was down at the expo and asked them, you know, name me a bee. And they said, honeybee. I said, do you know any others? No, there's only honeybees. Um, there's not. Um, honeybees are introduced, right? They were introduced to North America um, at the end of the well, 1500s, early 1600s. So if you want an invasive species, there's one for you, okay? Um, so they were brought in. North America never had a honeybee. And they were brought in because they make honey. Um, and it's a great, what? Carbohydrate, you could store it, you can use it when it's winter um, as a food resource. But, you know, the 4,000 other bees that inhabit North America are solitary bees. And so those solitary bees don't make honey. They don't make combs. They don't have big hives. And so they're pretty much, right, going around their business, and we don't even probably pay attention to them or know they're there. You're going to start seeing what? In another month or so, as the desert starts to bloom, you'll start seeing digger bees coming out of the ground. Um, and those are solitary bees. You'll see leaf cutter bees. Um, if you've ever gone in your yard and, or look on a plant, you see little half moon shapes removed out of a, a leaf. Those bees take those leaves that mama bee takes that, cuts the leaf, and then rolls it up and stuffs it into a little crevice. She gets another one and she rolls them into a little like capsule that she fills with nectar and pollen and then lays an egg in there and caps it and then she stacks them end to end and then she dies. And those bees will emerge on their own. They find little crevices. Other bees find big holes into the ground. Um, so a great thing to look at when you're walking by is stop and show people a dead piece of limb in a Palo Verde or in a mesquite. And you watch because you'll see what happens. Those dead limbs, right, I see them as habitat, which they are. Um, my wife's really good because she lets me have a certain percentage of dead limbs in our trees in our yard, okay? Uh, she goes, what's that dead tree doing there? A few years ago, it's a snag, look at, and, and, I, and she was a biologist too, so um, beetles like to hit those, those dead trees. So if you've ever gone and looked at the fire areas, um, you'll see a lot of the, the trees, like the bush fire or earlier the cactus fire, you'll see these trees and you'll see, um, you know, it's all dead, but you'll see little holes in them from beetles. There's a group of beetles, bupressed beetles, they like to bore little holes and galleries inside there because that's what their larvae eat. And then who finds them? Solitary bees. And they'll go in there and, and provision it and, and have little cells in there and they'll carry it out. Did you ever notice like if you open your window that you haven't opened in a long time, you might see like a bougainvillea, little things falling out of it or whatever plants, leaves falling out of it. That's a leaf cutter bee. Found a little crevice, you haven't opened to crank that window open since you returned back to the valley. Um, and they're using it. They find those little crevices, okay? And they're really, you know, opportunistic in urban environments. So. Um, but they don't make honey. Um, and, but they do cap their ends like that. So you can, I'm not as wise, but you can cap, you can look at the materials that are capped and try to get an idea of what bees are there. Here's another one. Um, how old are they? Um, so rattlesnakes typically you hear um, and shells of like tortoises. Okay, it's, uh, it could be, Tricky, never give an exact number, okay? It's just, you won't know, and that's okay, right? Not to know exactly. You can count, um, there's research here, where pulled this off uh, the web, where you can see where the first, um, you know, part of the rattle was, and then you can count, 
each year as long as what? When they're molt when they're molting. Sorry, wrong, wrong group. But when they're shedding their skin, right? Um, that they don't lose part of that. Because if they lose it, then you're kind of what? You don't know where it began because you can't see that first button. And so you're just kind of estimating. You could probably say it's older than five if it, it has that. So, you know, again, you look at that. It's not a absolute. Same with desert tortoises. Um, they're kind of like tree rings, but desert tortoises, when they're young, you can see the growth rings. But as they old, get older, a few things happen, right? Resources, as you know, vary, right? We have lots of rain in the summer or we don't have rain. And so what happens? The growth rings might be really, really close together because they didn't grow much in one year. And then they might be a little further apart. And then when they get older, they all get jammed in. So I'm not even going to guess how old, maybe Tiffany's an expert at reptiles, um, <laughs> could venture, because this is from our tortoises, and we have a rough idea when they were born, but, um, you know, it gets tricky, right? Like, is that all one big year, or is there lots of years squished together in that one big? So you can, you can age them when they're younger, it's harder as they get older, okay? Um, as you go through there. And then, um, I like this one, ants don't have wings. Because I'm an ant guy too, so I worked, on, I worked on ants and people are like, right? They don't have wings. Have you ever seen them with wings? Some of you have, okay? So right now, in those big harvester ants and the ants that are all in the preserve, especially the ones that, what? You see the wings, when do you see the wings? Winged ones. Anybody think about when you saw the winged ones? When do we see these? Do you see these are, those are winged ants. And those are winged ants. And on that road there, right on the back of SEC's campus, we got winged ants, okay? What time of the year do you see those? Can you think about when you saw those? Okay, you might see one group of spring, but I haven't seen that species at least on this part of the preserve. Most are tied to the monsoon, all right? This time of year, what you see is, what's interesting is the ants you see running around, okay, and out on the surface are female ants, okay? They're pretty much all females. Males only show up for a very short period of time in a mating swarm, okay? So ma male ants do two things. They mate and they die. <laughs> That's about it, okay? Um, termite males, they get to hang around for a long time. Okay, but females don't, female ants don't need the males once they mate with them. And they'll mate maybe with 9, 10, 11 males. And they'll store all that sperm for her entire life. So those harvester ants with the big circles, female queen ants, if they're successful, they can live 25 years. And they have all, they keep the sperm alive, which is a really cool trick. And I think they even beat bats, so they're better than vertebrates in storing sperm, okay? And sharks and things like that. And so they can store that, and that's a whole other story. But they can actually provision out different male sperm to fertilize or not fertilize her eggs. Um, they have a weird way that they reproduce. Um, but they can control that. And then at a certain time of the year, they will make males and as well as females that are destined to become future queens. We call them alates. So the males have wings and these larger females that are bigger than workers have wings. They're called alates, unre the reproductives. So they haven't mated yet. And so right now, that brood is brooding. Well. I guess that's a good term for it, right? They're feeding those eggs, those larvae that hatch from those eggs, more food, and they're driving it to grow bigger. I mean, that's a whole, whole thing. It's like who decides whether you have males or females? It appears it's the workers. <laughs> they, get the, they feed them, and they can trim out male eggs from female eggs and not feed them, and you know, it's, a, it's a neat dynamic. But right now they're going to start, and what's going to happen? They're going to time it to the monsoons. Why? 
Okay, what about the water? You're right. Why? Flood. Pardon? Flooding? So why, why wait to, you know, flooding's dangerous, right? I'm a little, so what happens is, do you see them bubbling out of the ground there? So after a rain, the males and females come out of the ground, usually this particular species around sunset, or right before sunset, and they fly up into the air. Now, at our campus, we have a really cool situation because year after year now, they've been there since I've been there in 96, we know certain areas of the campus where there's mating aggregations. <laughs> you don't always see those. Um, and what they do on the ground there, I don't know, you can't see it so well, but back in there, that darker stuff in the middle of the road are thousands of ants, okay? And they're swirling around like that. And so males are trying to mate with females, and females are trying to get back out of there. Um, and so there's just, and you can smell the pheromones there, okay? And so they're triggered, though, by those first rains, not the very first. Because what does an ant female do? She mates, and then she flies off, and she finds a location to start to do what? Dig. And what's the best time of the year to dig? When it's wet, <laughs> right? Because you want to get deep enough, because if you don't get deep enough and the sun comes up, after a few days, that's going to get really hot. Okay, And deeper, you can also go deeper and you can avoid potentially predators out there. I've seen millipede, or excuse me, centipedes going in and other, other ant species. Well, they love female ants because they're filled with yolky eggs and they'll carry them back to their nest like a prize, okay? But when the ants fly, once she's mated, she'll land on the ground, she'll take her hind, her back legs, and she'll flip off and break off her wings because she no longer needs them. She'll dig into the ground, and she'll use that muscle tissue to help further develop her young and even metabolize it so when the eggs are hatched, she can feed them with fat reserves in her body as well as some of that muscle. The muscles degenerate because she no longer needs them to fly because she's never going to go back to the surface. Okay, And so that's kind of the nest. So the idea is I want to do this timing with these winter rains. There's a jet black ant out here that's pretty big. It's a harvester. Its timing has shifted to February after some of the winter rains, but it's cooler. You don't have to get as deeper. Okay. Um, last couple things here. You tell me. Um, have you seen this one? This is going to be coming out. This one I just say, what is it? But I want to hear what you think it is and what it does. Because Okay, I've heard mosquito hawk. Anything else? You're right, that's, it's called that? Crane fly, okay? So flies have, have two wings, as you can see. You can't see it really well. They have two vestigial wings that are underneath there. They're just little stubby things that are for balance when they fly. So this is, uh, yes, this is called a crane fly, and they're gonna be coming out here pretty soon. All right, and they fly around. Um, the males um, don't have functional mouth parts because they don't live long enough to feed, okay? <laughs> so one thing about insects, they spend a lot of time as larvae, a lot of them, like a year, and then they spend about a day or two, some of them, you know, or three, as an adult. So I don't know what you prefer, just being a kid <laughs> your whole life and a few days as an adult, I don't know. But these don't have mouth parts, um, the males, okay? They don't kill mosquitoes. Some of them will do some uh, pollination, the females, just to gather some um, you know, carbohydrates and things like that. But um, they don't attack anything. Um, they mate. She lays eggs, usually in the soil. And they spend their time in the soil as these little fly, little maggoty looking things that are, are kind of brown and tan. So, um, and then um, lastly, or almost lastly, um, what's this? Okay, so um, that cicada doesn't look like it's doing real well on the right, um, but that's a cicada there. And I bring this up because we all hear them, right? 
in the summer, that buzzing sound. How do they make their buzzing sound? Hey, crickets, right, stridulate with their, with their legs. These do it a little differently, and this is why I bring it up. I'm sneaking in natural history. I don't know what the, um, you know, the misconception is out here that these are 17-year cicadas. If you're from back east or in the Midwest, you know, last year we had 17-year cicadas. Our, um, those are very few. There's very few species that have a 17-year from I'm going to exist as a larvae for 17 years and four days as an adult. Okay? Um, that timing, and they have these mass emergence, okay? Ours out here, we have close to 40 different species in the southwest. Um, they don't have these mass, okay? Usually it's every year. Some species go every three years, but it's not a mass exodus where the ground's just bubbling up of, of cicadas, okay? Um, so we get these year after year. So, um, you know, you hear the buzzing, usually in the summertime, um, and who does the buzzing? So the misconception, one, is that, hey, we have 17-year cicadas. No, we don't have them here, and we have annual cicadas, or three-year, but not these mass emergence. The other is, who makes the sound? Both male, female, who, who makes that sound? Yeah, it's males only. Females don't. Um, females listen, okay? They don't stridulate. They actually are, they've been described as, and that one's upside down, they've been described almost like a, um, a musical instrument or like a violin because there's a lot of airspace um, in their abdomen region. They have an organ, a timbal, as it's called, and it's kind of like, um, I've seen it um, described, ever see those, uh, long ago, those little, um, clickers where you can push down and they click yeah, yeah. and it's, it's that expansion of the the metal right you click going down and then when it reforms it clicks back and that's what these organs do they the muscles are in between so when the muscles contract, they force these organs to collapse and they go click, 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 click. and then when the muscle relax it goes click, 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 click. and they can do this so fast that you get this chorus of sound. Um, and so the males will do this. And what time of the day? I know you hear them in the evening, but you also hear them midday. Hottest part of the day. Holy cow. Right? Why? Why and then how? So, okay, why do they do it in the middle of the day? What's not out during the day, typically? Predators, right? Kind of like what round tail ground squirrels do. Have you seen them? They go scampering around. I'm going, I'm going up here, I'm going over here. And boy, I just got really hot. And they run down and they cool off in the bottom of their burrow. They have a, a light patch of fur here and they nizzle down into their burrow and they thermally dump or transfer their heat, cool off and go running back because their predators out, right? Kind of crazy predators might be out, okay? Um, Cicadas do the same thing, but how are they able to do that without, how do they cool off? That's the consequence living out here in the hot, right? If you're out during the day, you've got to be able to thermoregulate. And what cicadas do, along their back, there are little pores, and they lose water, and they evaporatively cool. Where do they get the water from? They sit on mesquite trees, a lot of them, and they have a long mouth part, and you can see one over there, and they pierce into the xylem, which is the water conductive tissue of the tree, and they drink water. And so they depend on that mesquite for their water source, and then they can evaporative cool, because the water is coming up through the roots. So they let the mesquite tree go down for those, that water. And it's a really neat thing. They use evaporative cooling, and that's how they're able to survive and then also call. And females listen, but also certain species of wasp listens to those calls. It's called a cicada killer. <laughs> and it's a wasp that is attuned to the frequency of the cicadas, and they can actually triangulate where they are. And they'll grab them, even they try to escape in midair, they'll grab them right off of a, a limb and carry them away, okay? Like that one. 
So that's called a cicada killer. So you can find those. You don't, if you see a wasp flying toward them. Okay? And then I think we got to wrap up. Um, you can go through this one I have for you. Any idea what this is on this uh, dead piece of spines on the cactus that was laying there? Have you ever seen that before? Termites. termites. I have some live termites over there for you if you've never seen a live termite before. Um, and I can clean up very quickly. Um, <laughs> and so uh, some of the myths continue. There's, I guess somebody wanted me to put El Chupacabra in there um, as a myth. But, and there's a sunset because I'm saying goodbye. And then uh, next slide, um, I'll say the end since we can click up. So if you have any questions, I know we're going to kind of simultaneously clean. I'll be over here. If you have any questions, can ask me now or anything. I hope um, just feel free. OK? Um, oh, OK. John, if you can repeat this for the mic. There's several questions. They're all in the same kind of general trend. The scorpions. Are there other creatures that have immunity to the venom and do the same species of scorpions? In other words, will they sting their brothers and sisters? Will that be a problem? That's a good question. Um, so there are a few species that seem to be um, immune um, to uh, scorpion venom or just tolerate it quite a bit. Some are a little grasshopper mouse that can hop along and, and eat. Um, scorpions and be stung. And um, I know of uh, pallid, pallid bats, uh, bats they'll drop on the ground and they can grab scorpions. And sometimes they're envenomated, but they appear to uh, resist that uh, venom, even from bark scorpions. And they're able to uh, in ingest them. So that works in terms of things being uh, immune or tolerant of it. And then um, some scorpions can sting one another. When they're soft and eat, it doesn't, um, I don't know if that's the case with all of them, um, if they're tolerant. Each individual is a little different uh, mixture, but if you're dosing pretty good, it's still going to affect the nervous system. So I don't know on all of them if they um, can eat, but yes, they can, they can cannibalize each other. So, and, yep, any questions? So I know, um, I know um, with giant hairy scorpions, they, when they mate, males and females kind of face off, and the male will grab her pedipalps and hold it. I don't know if you've ever heard of scorpion mating, but um, <laughs> what they do is the male will hold, like the female, uh, pedipalps so she, she doesn't, and keep her at bay so she doesn't sting them, okay, and become a meal. So now it's got the female like that, and then what scorpions do is they lay a, a, a packet of sperm like a packet on the ground and it, it, it kind of sticks up and has almost like a little hook on it so it rises up and his job is to drag her over that in position so she can take it up into her reproductive tract and fertilize her eggs and then he has to figure out how do I <laughs> get out of here okay and some researchers I've read accounts the, the males just kind of let go and run. Um, others try to let go with one and kind of stun, you know, like push her and, and move her around and, and then get out of there. So um, I've, I've seen them mating on the roads <laughs> in the parks at night. Um, and it's kind of a dance. They kind of pull one another. I guess you could put it to music or, or whatever. So, but that's what I... Uh, I have for you, and if you want to take a look over there, thank you. Thank you, John. That was awesome. It makes me want to go back and take uh, <laughs> university biology. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for, to our live streamers for joining us. Thank you for your patience with our technological difficulties. Thank you all so much for coming, and we'll see you out on the trails. It shows you, you know, what it looks like behind the set, right? So this is what it looks like behind the, sorry. So 
we have this boot and you can see the you can see here's what you would see on the saguaro and then as you turn it you can see what's actually inside the saguaro that forms the boot so this is where the woodpecker would go in this probably wasn't a woodpecker nest because it's pretty small but this is pretty large <laughs> so maybe a big woodpecker um, but you would just see this uh, facing the outside on a saguaro. So it would look like that. This is what you see when you walk by a saguaro. And that's what's inside. And that's what's inside. Oh see? Yeah. Very cool. That's yeah. Cool. So that's a really neat to see. And then some of you may see like on Palo Verdes, these little holes in the Palo Verde seeds. Those are uh, a brooked beetle emerges out of those. So it's a little beetle that they've been laid, their eggs been laid, they eat the seed and get the nutrients and then they emerge as an adult. And then there's another brooked beetle that will go into those holes and eat the other seeds that are in the pod. Yeah, so, you know, I was looking at the termites, which are very cool. Yeah, have you seen? Yeah. And, but I, there's something about Arizona termites. I remember when we bought our house. There there's, the sub, there's subterranean termites. They're not going to, like, destroy your house overnight. Okay. Um, but they come up through the, the crack foundations. Okay. And then as they come up from the foundations, that's how they get in the wood and you can't see them. That's unique. Um, yeah, there's, no, you don't have them back east, so it's unique, it's subterranean, and they can extend over a huge, huge area, a, a single termite, you know, they're just multiple, so, and they'll fly, that's another one that flies, termites will fly uh, with the summer rains as well, so you'll see them with these straight wings, and they're smaller, and they'll fly with a first rain, like, it just has to drop a few, and they just go, and they're flying, fluttering,